many of you already know Pat, but I will just give you a quick, uh, she is an author, a speaker, a workshop leader, a career coach. She's the founder of the four phase uh, system, uh, four phase coaching system called Bulletproof Your Career Methodology. It consists of, uh, I, I was struck because the actually there is a CPA in, in, uh, as part of what she offers, but there's also an E in there. So it's C-E-P-A and, and the, uh, it's clarify, eliminate, prioritize and accelerate to bulletproof your career. And we're going to learn a lot of things today, but in particular, we're going to learn exactly what a gigger is, because that's part of Pat's presentation. So without further ado, I welcome Pat Romboletti. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for um, joining me this morning. I was telling everybody I lived in Chicago. I lived at McClure Court for three great years. Um, I miss the pizza, I miss the food, I don't miss the cold and the wind, um, but I also do miss the sports. So I should, those are my fondest memories, right? I, I wanna do a food tour because I've been in seven cities, all with great food. So Chicago will be one of the top in that tour. Um, so it is gonna be a little bit of a mashup today. There's a lot of topics I want to share. Um, there's, there were a few in the, in the um, overview. I will talk about the gig economy, but I thought it would be really helpful to start with a little bit of the state of the union um, that I see from my um, vent, um, purview, right? So um, you mentioned um, the Zoom call. So each week, uh, we're going on three years now, I do a call at 7.45 p.m. on Thursdays. If there's anybody here who wants to join at the end, I'll share a link so that you can participate. But I do a workshop in the beginning and then there's anywhere now from 600 to 750 people on the call. And over the time that I've been doing it, um, we've had as high a spike as 900 plus um, during the height of April and May of last year. Um, so that affords me a little bit of a, a, a sampling of what's going on in the marketplace. And I combine that with my coaching clients to give you some insights. So um, each week, those I, I ask people to report to me once they've landed so that we started to have some statistics about landing. And last year, I started that in March um, during the um, beginning of the COVID lockdown. And between March and December of, of last year, we had 297 people land, which was an exciting number given that we were only a microcosm of the entire world, right? Um, but this year, and in the last few months, it has been on fire. And that's my biggest message to you. Um, I was in recruiting for well more over a decade. I have been doing um, coaching for about eight, nine years, um, coached as many as 900, I think we're heading into. Um, and I have never, ever seen hiring as hot as it is right now. Um, so let me give you a little um, insight in the landing category, and this is only those people who report to me, because some people just don't let me know, um, just those reported um, in the month of July already, that's only two Thursdays and we have three more to go. We've had 105 people land in one week in, in the first week of July, the first of July, um, Thursday's call, we had 65 people land. And I thought it was gonna be pretty slow last week because of the holiday, but indeed we had 40. Now, let me give you some, some build up to that. In May, long month, we had 118 for the whole month. And in um, June, we had 160. So we're already at 105. And if we keep trending, um, you can see that July is gonna blow the lid off of the landings. Um, a couple of things that I can tell you. Um, number one, when I, in my coaching um, clients, I can tell you, and also from when I get the landing stories from everybody, they're talking about this. They're talking about the fact that they wind up with two or three or four opportunities coming to a head at the same time. Most of them are facing the dilemma of, you know, opportunity A is coming through, but I really want C, how do I control that? Well, you can't, but it's a good problem to have, right? Um, so my point is that I'm, uh, even in my coaching and getting people ready for interviews, I am not coaching anybody for interview prep who isn't, who doesn't have multiple opportunities on their plate. So if you're sitting there going, why not me? Um, hopefully some of the things I'm gonna to share today will help, but also um, remember one of my mottos to our Zoom group is compare and despair. 
everybody's journey is different. And every single one of those 105 who landed in July um, will attest to the fact that a day, a week or so before they actually got the, we're sending you an offer letter or we're gonna give you a verbal. Before then they were going, why not me? When is my turn gonna come? And then boom, the next day they've got multiple offers, right? So I'm gonna give you some tips about how to um, land sooner, but I wanted to give you some insight um, in terms of at least a quick overview of what's going on in the marketplace. And I'll talk, I'll be talking more about it um, in my Zoom call on this coming Thursday. Um, so I, I wanna, um, I want to answer Jerry's uh, question about the gigger. So I don't know how many of you have had a chance to watch my TED talk. If you have not, um, I encourage you to do so. Um, I, I did prepare the research for that um, a little over two years ago, and I will be sharing this morning some of the updates of that research. But what I predicted and what I saw is coming true. So I, when I was asked to do the TED talk, they said, we want you to do a TED talk about giggers. And, and this was in Atlanta. And I said, what are you thinking of? And they said, you know, talk about how people can have gig jobs like, you know, Uber drivers. And I said, we're in Atlanta. That audience is going to be full of Home Depot, Coca-Cola, new Rubbermaid. They don't want to drive a, a car. Uh, a, 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 they don't want to be an Uber driver. They want a five week vacation. They want that, that corporate. Um, but, but I will talk about what I talk about in my book, which is unfortunately today because of the shortness of tenure um, in roles, every job really has to be seen as a gig. And it's not because companies are more ruthless. It's not because um, things are just gotten vicious out there. It's because companies have to be nimble and agile and constantly be transforming. So before they could settle down, I think there's some IT people on here, before you could settle down and, and you might have five years of, of very small changes, you can't last five years without making some pretty drastic changes in most businesses in order to stay nimble. And that certainly is even more the case since we've had a year of disruption, right? So the idea that I want you to think about and what I talk about in my TED talk, and if you have watched it, go back and take some notes, is how to think and act like a gigger because you need to be have that nimbleness and that agility. And as I talk in a, in a few minutes about how the rules have changed, it really comes into play. Um, and for those, let me give you an example of the disruption. So I have um, a program called Onboard to Bulletproof. It's a 12 month program once somebody lands. In that group, within the first six months, I have had now five people have massive disruptions around them. Um, one person has had three CEOs since January. Um, another person had a reorganization. Another one had an acquisition. All, nothing on the radar when they joined, already starting to happen and cause disruption, right? So I see it and live it every single day. So um, that's a big part of what I'm talking about in terms of being more like a gigger, which means that you, you go in, you do a really great job, uh, you know, giggers do a really great job so they can get testimonials and get their next gig. Um, you want to think about doing a really great job, but also constantly having your radar out because you need to be able, in my estimation, no need to ever be in transition again if you follow the bulletproof methodology and do the kind of activities that keep you always on somebody's radar, okay? Um, so speaking of radars and being on somebody's radar, one of the topics um, that comes up all the time and came up again as we were talking about today is working with recruiters, right? Um, and it really does mash up and dovetail into how the rules have changed a little bit. But the rules that, that are out there now in terms of the risk aversion that we'll get more deeper into, in terms of for recruiters has always been the case. And what do I mean by that? Um, when a company, this is really important to know, and I'm going to actually take you online today and show you how to find the right recruiters. I'm going to be sending you a document to help you communicate with the right recruiters. But first, I want you to understand something. When a company is looking to hire someone, they use recruiters to recruit somebody in their industry, preferably in one of their competitors or target companies. If it's, a, if it's an industry that has a lot of non-compete going on around it, um, they may come to the recruiter and say, we can't come recruit from Hewlett Packard or Dell, et cetera, but we want these aligned targets. But here's the point. 
companies do not go to recruiters and say, hey, we need a CFO. It doesn't matter what industry they've been in. It doesn't matter it's, if it's been public or private. It doesn't matter if it's been manufacturing or software. We just need a really great CFO. That's never the conversation. In my 18 years of doing search, I recruited a lot of uh, controllers, VP finance and, and CFOs. And the conversation always was exactly this. We recruiter, we need you to go find somebody in our industry who has, if they were a public company, they wanted a public company CFO. If they were private, they wanted a private company CFO um, that had certain size, you know, scope and scale. So um, in terms of number of employees, number of total sales in the company. So they wanted a lot of the matching numbers um, to match up in terms of scale. Um, and then um, it, there was always a delineation between manufacturing or where someone was producing a product and the financial ramifications that are very different than a service. And the and there's also a difference between, you all know this, between that and those who are in, for example, software where there's re revenue recognition and other challenges, right? So they were very, very, very specific. Now, does that mean that a company would never hire somebody um, outside of their industry? No, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about the rules changing. But when it comes to would they use a recruiter to go say, doesn't matter what industry or we're in medical device and you know I think technology would be just as good. That's not the conversation. So the, the question is, you know, how do you find the right recruiters and how do you know what recruiters are looking for? They are not looking for their own preference. They're looking for the the work order in a sense, the order from their client to say, only bring me candidates who have done this, are currently doing this, um, have most recently done this in this industry, in this size, et cetera, right? So what does that mean for you? It means that recruiters are a piece of the puzzle, but they're not the, the end all and be all. Um, they, in, in, when I'm working with my clients, we really carve out a special niche and I'm gonna show you today how we uh, employ a strategy for that. But at the end of the day, um, you want to consider recruiters one, one sh tool in the shed, but not the biggest tool in the shed by any stretch. Although one of the reasons why I wanted to start with this today is that when there is what is going on now, and you may have heard about the great resignation um, in the month of, let me get my stat right, in the month of um, April, 4. million people or 2.7% of the U.S. workers left their job, they quit. Um, there's a whole phenomenon of why that's going on, four big factors. And if we have time in the q and I'll, I'll get to those. Um, but uh, according to Microsoft survey, 41% of people say, I'm going to leave my job this year, right? So when there's this problem, companies are having a problem getting candidates, they outsource the problem to recruiters. Now it's their hot potato to handle. So recruiters are very, very busy right now and much, much more active, okay? So I'm gonna show you um, a strategy for finding and reaching out to the right recruiters. And, I, and it starts with understanding the metrics around re that recruiters work with. There are currently 1.9 million recruiters on LinkedIn. So when people say to me, I've got 10 recruiters, I've got 30 recruiters, I connected with all of my recruiters in Chicago or Cleveland. Um, so I know I've got a good group of recruiters. I repeat, there are 1.9 million recruiters on LinkedIn. So any of those numbers are, as you can tell, sort of a drop in the bucket. That's number one. Number two number to know is that the average recruiter, some do a couple, some do 20, but the average recruiter does about 10 searches a year. So again, if you put all your eggs in one basket, Robert Half is a great organization. There's many um, organizations that specialize in finance, but there's plenty of boutique firms that work in an in industry, especially middle market industry. Um, there's private equity recruiters who are looking on behalf of private equity firms for recruiters that may not touch uh, uh, Robert Half for that um, work, right? So there's plenty of recruiters in that 1.9 and they're only doing 10. Now I'm talking to a group of people who know about numbers, right? So when I tell you 1.9, they're only doing an average of 10, that means it's a numbers game. And the more recruiters in the right sector that you have in your, in your connections, the better you are. 
There's another aspect though of connecting with recruiters. Um, and I'm gonna be including a second document which is called Recruiter 101. And it explains the strategy that I'm gonna share with you. And it also covers uh, this topic, which is when you connect with a recruiter, you're connecting with a connector, which means by definition, recruiters have very large universes of connections certainly a few thousand, never just a few hundred unless they're just getting started. So what does that mean to you? It means that understanding um, how LinkedIn thinks about algorithms and follow the money, LinkedIn thinks about algorithms from the standpoint of how does certain behavior, how does certain um, phenomenons on our platform allow us to charge more for advertising? Um, that's the name of the game, right? So here's what they know. When they can go to their advertisers and say, we have a very active universe. The number of, of connections on average is this, the number of, of new connections is this. So they share those stats. So they love people who are connectors, people who have a good database, a good um, number of connections. It is a database until you start to work it, but that's another um, uh, workshop. So Here's what they what happens when you connect to a recruiter, you automatically get greater visibility across the entire LinkedIn um, platform. And so you'll start to say, well, I started doing your strategy and I started connecting to recruiters. I didn't hear from those recruiters, but I got uh, more activity and I got these other recruiters second level that are reaching out to me. That's because LinkedIn is doing a much better job of sharing your profile across the platform once you connect with connectors, whether it's a recruiter or anybody else with um, a lot of, of connections, right? So that's a byproduct um, residual um, benefit from deploying my um, recruiter strategy, okay? So here, let me give you the, the, the nutshell of what the recruiter strategy is all about. Um, when a recruiter gets a search, the first place they go is LinkedIn because why? It's the only self-reported database in the world, really. When we used when we didn't have LinkedIn, we were using databases that were out of date. So it, it's the very first place that they go and they get the information that they need because remember their client has said this industry, this years of experience, these credentials, et cetera, they can get all that in one fell swoop. So let's talk about what it takes, what the contract is. Many of you have probably reviewed recruiter contracts. Um, in a retained recruiter's contract, they agree to submit three to five qualified candidates to the client at the end of the um, search, right? So here are the numbers to, to keep in mind. In order for me as a recruiter to get those three to five finalists in, into my client, I know that I need to start with about somewhere around 50 or so um, prospects, 50 to 70, mostly 50 to 70 um, qualified candidates, meaning they at least meet the beginning criteria of industry, years of experience, right, um, credentials, et cetera, right? So that's where I start. Now, here's the more important number to know that in order for me to get those 70 out of my LinkedIn when I do my search, um, when I conduct the first search, I'm gonna get hundreds of uh, profiles. There's 750 million people on LinkedIn. I can put in all the type criteria I want. I'm still going to get hundreds and hundreds of options, right? I know that I need somewhere between, I need to look at somewhere between 85 and 100 profiles in order to get the 50 to 70 that I'm going to start with, right? And, and you might be thinking that's an awfully big number to start with when you only want to get to three to five. But the truth is that 50% of the people, even the last years that I was doing recruiting and recruiters that I've talked to today say, Pat, it's still exactly the same. 50% of the people that I reach out to, they clearly haven't read my book. They clearly haven't listened to my TED talk and they ignore the outreach, right? I've literally had people come back two years later and say, hey, do you still have that search? I'm, I'm interested. It's like, it's a little late, right? So 50% ignore. So let's say I started with 80, now I'm down to 40. And from that 40, I start vetting. And some people aren't qualified, some people aren't interested, some people are too expensive. All of the things that won't relocate, don't wanna work for that company, all those things. So we usually get it down to about 20 that we thoroughly vet. You're really getting a look behind the curtain, guys. So this is exactly how it worked for years and years. Get down to the 20 that we would vet to get down to about the 12 that we spend time with in the old days, meet with, now vet on, on um, online, and, and then present the candidates to the client, right? So 
Why do I tell you all of that? Because my strategy that I'm going to show you is going to teach you how to become a first level connection with the right recruiters. <clears throat> because when you are a first level connection with the right recruiters and they conduct that search, you're going to come up in the front of the search results because that's the way LinkedIn's algorithm works. LinkedIn produces a search results not based on the saturation of keywords, but based on first and foremost on your level of connectivity to the person doing the search. And in this case, which would be the recruiter, right? So if you are a first level connection, you're going to end up in one of the first pages, first two or three pages of the search. And that's important because if I get enough candidates, when I get to profile number 86 and your profile number 87, I'm never going to see you. And anything beyond 87, I'm never going to see because I've got the pool of talent that I need to work with. And I stop my search because now I also have a deadline that my client would like that person in the chair sooner than later. And I've also got a retainer sitting in the bank. So I'm real anxious to make the client happy, right? So I, if you're number 87 and beyond, you're never going to be seen. So the, the, the game here is twofold. Get to the front of the pack so that you're likely, most likely to be seen by the recruiter. And number two, once you do that, you're starting to get greater visibility anyways across the whole platform and other recruiters will be finding you, right? So when people say, I can't get recruiters to pay attention to me, if you're not doing anything to get them to pay attention, it just won't happen. And it's not a matter of just um, keywords in your, in your um, profile, because if you have the right keywords, but so, so doesn't somebody else who's a first level connection or even a second and you're a third, it's just not going to happen. Okay, so I'm going to take you online to um, LinkedIn. I'm going to show you how to find the right recruiters. And I'm also going to provide you with a document that has screenshots, step-by-step -step directions, and the exact wording to use when you reach out to recruiters, right? So I'll show you that after I show you how to find them. Um, the main thing to know is that recruiters primarily conduct searches by industry category. So, um, you know, industrial, medical device, technology, um, computer software. Now it's sort of, you find them by looking up SaaS because that's the world, right? Um, or cloud. So they're, they're in that sector. In your case, as you know, from some of the, the companies that, that probably sponsor you, that offer offices available, there are also companies that specialize in just in finance. And those are good to cover those bases, but you're only getting, remember 1.9 million, you're not getting the full complement because I never specialized just in CFO. I specialized in middle market. My, mine were the closely held private businesses was my specialty. So I was doing anything from marketing to CEO to CFO, COO, didn't matter. The other thing that you want to get is to connect with recruiters who specialize in private equity. If you are in that middle market category yourself or are looking to be in that, right? So there are recruiters who just do search in private equity. There are also recruiters who just specialize in and if that's a category that you can, can fit into, it's great to connect with some of those recruiters too. So much broader, um, I want you to think more broadly and don't think about, I want to connect with all the recruiters in Chicago, because if they're not doing search in your sector, it won't, they may connect with you, they may not, um, because they know they can't help you, but it won't be the, the answer to your prayers, okay? So let's quick pop over here so I can show you. And again, um, I'm going to move fairly quickly um, in the interest of time, but um, I will have for you um, the document that I'll show you in a minute that um, I'll be handing out that you can get to walk you through. So I'm going to start in the search bar and I'm not going to start by using, you see I have here um, CFO retained. I can do that and I'll show you the results that that will bring up, but I'll explain to you the complexities of this. So I'm on the first page and I put in CFO retained. Now, if you're saying, hey, I'm VP finance, I'm, I'm controller, I'm FP&A, I'm a different category, but at the senior level. Um, and, and that's what I'm, when you're putting in retained, you're getting that more senior level. So they usually are doing searches in director level and above. Um, if I am doing CFO, I'm also doing the complement of other positions within the finance category on a retained basis. So it's, it's a good place to start and it's a better place, especially as I explained something else. So I'm gonna say CFO retained, that just went into the search bar on the, on the homepage. When I get to this page, 
um, I'm going to go click on all filters. But before I do, I want to state something. If you currently, and this is, I didn't used to have to have this disclaimer, but I do now because LinkedIn has changed it, changed things. If you are not currently a business premium subscriber. So if you're a biz, business job search, I think they have some other categories. If you are not the highest level of business premium, there are two other levels above that. You don't need that, but you really need the investment of business premium, not just for this, but for finding target companies and so many other things and for curating and cultivating your network after you land. So it's a good investment. Um, I think it's 70 something a month. I pay annually 600 or so a month, um, a, a, a year annually, but on a month to month basis, it's about 70 something dollars, probably what you're not spending on transportation and gas um, during COVID that you can reinvest here, okay? So just, just you won't be able to find, um, do the search and reach out to the recruiters without that. Okay, so now I click on all filters and I only need one other selection on this page. I go down to industry and I select staffing and recruiting. And if you don't see staffing and recruiting when you go there, just click on add industry and start typing in staffing and it will pop up. So basically what I'm saying to LinkedIn is find me any recruiter or anybody who's classified themselves as being in the staffing and recruiting industry and somewhere in their LinkedIn profile, they have the term CFO or retains, right? So then I'm just going to hit, um, uh, hold on, results. And I get 1300. Remember 1.9 million. Now, here's the idiosyncrasy about doing CFO um, retained. One of the things that will come up in this search will be people who are in a CFO role on behalf of that retained firm because the larger firms of course have their own CFOs. However, um, it's, it's just a sorting process. You will have to disqualify those. So um, the, the very first gentleman qualifies for that. He is um, a, a CFO at an executive recruiting firm. However, just below him is Teresa Green and she is does commercial growth, private equity, retained executive recruiter at DHR. So she is a fit, he isn't, and it's it really is a numbers game. And it's this is once you get doing this, a really quick process. So if I go and look at Teresa, um, and I'm gonna see that, you know, yep, she's describing herself as doing search in the commercial and private equity, senior associate. She looks like she's probably a really good match. Um, and that's somebody you would wanna connect with. And you're gonna not send a message, but you're gonna send a connection request. Now, um, one other caveat to know, if if you go to um, a profile, it's very hard for me to get to third level connections. I have too many connections, so I can't even demo it um, in, in a morning's time. But if I had pulled up Teresa Green and she had been a third level connection, there is a possibility that connect would not have been an option. It would have said message and more, but fear not, if that's the case, if you click on more, if connect isn't showing and you click on more, connect will be in that drop down menu right there. Okay, so a little, little idiosyncrasy. Now I wanna uh, stop sharing for a second and pop you over. I'm gonna do a couple more demos, but I wanna pop over to um, the document to show you the languaging. Um, this is the document I'm gonna send to you. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's got all of the screenshots. And when you get to page 14, this is really important. This is the exact wording that I want you to use because this gets the highest level of response because it speaks to the recruiter and, and their business. And I explained that in great detail in the Recruiter 101. So I noticed that you conduct searches in my industry. Um, you could say if you're going to a CFO search in my, in my specialty, right? Because you only have 300 characters here. I would like to connect with you and I invite you to consider me as a resource for candidates for any of your searches. In other words, if you're not doing a search that I'm a match for, that's okay, let's connect and I'd be happy to help you. Maybe you need a controller and I might've had a dozen that I could refer you to, right? Um, I will also send you my resume by email. Please keep me in mind if I'm a match for any of your future projects. And then on page 15, I give you the follow-up message that you send with your email, recognizing that you won't in most instances, probably 80% of the cases, they won't have their email in their profile, but once you become a first level connection, their email will be available to you and you'll be able to um, send them your, your uh, resume, right? The real reason you're sending the resume is just to have another touch point. 
most recruiters these days don't even keep a database of, of active resumes, like put it, we'll put it in the database, we'll go back to it two years from now, because they know about the disruption that's going on. So they know that they're out of date almost as soon as they put them in the, in the, in the database, but you're sending it just to have another touch point. What will happen is you now have first level connections that you're going to come up first in the search. You also now have greater visibility and you've made an offer and many many times you'll see testimonials in the document that i'm sending you many many times people get phone calls from recruiters not as much these days because recruiters are so busy but if they're not busy and they have a, a moment um they're going to reach out to you and if you are in a very senior level you're really going to get a lot of phone calls most likely if you're really hitting the sweet spot and i'll tell you why because they know that cfos vps of finance make decisions about hiring search firms. So calling you and getting to know you is both a get to know a candidate for a search and get to know somebody who could hire them in the future to conduct a search. So they're highly motivated to do that. I was coaching a, um, a CEO of a very large um, corporation and he connected to like 20 recruiters and he got 20 phone calls. He said, oh my God, it's so great. I said, they're going to want to sell you something. Just know, but it's okay. You're still going to get to talk to them. Right. And, and sure enough, he, that was before COVID and he didn't have to pay for lunch um, for about two months. He was being wined and dined like crazy. Okay. So let me go back and show you some other ways. Cause I, I wanted to show you that CFO uh, search first, but I will tell you that if you are the, that one of the best things for you to do is to expand that to your industry category and to expand it to, um, if you're interested in it, to um, private equity and to expand it to diversity inclusion if that's applicable. applicable okay, so let me just quickly give you a quick reshow on that um, so that it's kind of, it's always good to see something twice anyways, right? So I'm going to go back to my home screen and I'm going to assume at this point, so let's say I'm in um, I'm in the auto industry. So that could be, right? So I'm just gonna use that automotive and retained, right? Um, I'm gonna hit enter. So just translate this to industrial. Um, again, I will tell you that if you happen to be in computer software, it's much better to search on cloud um, than if, you, if that's the industry you've came, come from, cloud retained versus software because it just seems to get a much better, more robust um, group of contemporary recruiters. It's a good way to go. Um, but I'm, I'm now back to all filters. I'm simply going to go down to industry and I'm going to select staffing and recruiting again. And I now have 1,200 recruiters. Remember, 1.9 million. Look how many in, it, in every category. Um, so here's somebody who's 14 years experience identifying the best leadership talent in Europe and North America in the automotive industry. So you're going to find a pretty good hit rate here of folks that are absolutely in the automotive industry. It's a, a very tight, tight, but very still very large group, right? Um, and again, if I do private equity, only if I spell it correctly, um, I'm going to find 2,000 recruiters who specialize in private equity. And, and, and you can see like Tom is even more specific industrials within private equity, which is one of their favorite categories. Anyways, this could be healthcare, um, whatever the industry that you most recently were in is what you would be putting there, okay? So this is gonna help you find the right recruiters. If you don't get a, a, um, an acceptance, there's two reasons right now. Recruiters are really, really busy. So they don't always check their, their invitations when they're really, really busy. They're busy trying to fill roles. Or number two, because you didn't, they, they look at, they are no longer doing search in that sector, even though they haven't updated their LinkedIn, or they just, you don't seem to match what they're most active in right now, right? Um, it's important to remember something. Recruiters are a lot like, um, I call it commercial real, or a residential real estate, right? First of all, that you would connect with multiple recruiters inside the same firm because they all have their own book of business within that firm. They don't necessarily collaborate and cooperate because then they have to split the fees. So follow the money. Um, so, so go ahead and connect with multiple folks with inside of a firm. Um, they will, they also, there are some recruiters, you know, the reason that I said some recruiters do two searches a year and some do 22 searches a year, and then it averages out to 10 to 11, because there are some people who it's sort of like a hobby, 
right? Much like real estate. I sell a house, I take a vacation. I, I place, make a placement, I take some time off. That's very, very typical. Um, so just know that that's why it's a numbers game. My, my strong recommendation that you'll see in the document that I send you is that you connect initially using this methodology with 25 or 30 recruiters. And if you have can slice across multiple categories, i.e. private equity, um, software, industrial, and more than, than just one niche, then for sure, at least 25 or 30, you've got to get in the numbers game when it's 1.9 million. And then my other request to you is that every single week for the rest of your career, you add five to 10 recruiters. All of my clients in my onboarding program, that's one of their check the box um, activities. It takes less than 15 minutes on a Saturday morning. And that means that they're constantly adding to their network. I have clients that have landed now for nine months. So they're they, you know, reaching the almost a year's tenure and they're getting calls from recruiters virtually one a week about new opportunities. It doesn't mean that they're changing, but if you're a gigger, what you're doing is listening for what's going on in the marketplace, what's the compensation that's being offered for these roles, getting a real sense of having your pulse on the industry when you are allowing those recruiters. So don't be part of that 50% who ignores them. They're taking the calls and they're getting all kinds of insights and information about the marketplace and, the, and what's going on out there, right? So. A, a kind of a fire hose on recruiters because I want to pop into uh, what how the rules have changed a little bit. Um, but it, the documents that I send to you are com very comprehensive. Um, what I'm going to do is create a Dropbox and Joyce will um, send you the link to the Dropbox and it will have those uh, that document that I showed you the step by step and it'll also have the Recruiter 101. If you want it faster, if you can't wait, um, you can go to my um, website, um, which is just Bulletproof Your career.com and there's a place way up at the top of the thing to fill in um, the a request to get that and it'll be sent right out to you but she she'll have that link um, sometime this morning okay all right so moving on to um, why why I talk about the rules have changed so you know I, I mentioned I want to give you some updates on what's going on in the um, in the market um, and going on since my LinkedIn or excuse me my TED talk um, when I did my TED talk, couple of things that I have updated because I did several workshops just on bulletproofing recently. Um, in, in my TED talk, I talk about a category of companies called unicorns. And unicorns are companies that um, grow to a billion dollars, rapidly grow to a billion dollars in valuation, right? And it was quite a phenomenon. Think of Airbnb, um, Uber, those were in the unicorn category. They come on the scene and they boom up to a billion dollars and boom, they're going public. When I did my TED talk two years ago, well, eight, 20, uh, the fall of 2018, so it's now going on three. When I did that TED talk, there were a couple hundred unicorns, right? There were also some decacorns, which is 10 billion. Um, but when I went to review that information, as of March 2021, there are now over six hundred companies classified as unicorns. Um, I am going to share in the Dropbox an Excel spreadsheet that I was able to get my hands on and download um, from CB Insights. You may be familiar with them. And it is a sortable list in Excel. And I know y'all know Excel. It's a sortable list in Excel of the unicorn companies and you can sort through by industry and by size, et cetera. So lots of flexibility and they were wonderful enough to also include in that list the private equity firms that are investing in those companies. So that also tells you not just private equity firms investing in those unicorns, but it helps you see what sector those private particular private equity firms are, are into. So you may be interested in a private equity backed company that isn't in the unicorn category and, and you're probably going to find the the uh, pri the um, VC company um, on the side that a VC firm rather that is focused on that. So I have a client right now. Um, we're really focused on insure tech, and we've been really digging out the VCs that are focused on insure tech. And we found several um, fintech and insure tech companies in that unicorns list. So just know that in th in less than three years, it's grown from 200 to 600. And when you think about that, recognize. Every one of those unicorn companies is disrupting 
a legacy company. It's just the way it is, right? So what I was talking about, the rapidity that I talked about in my, in my TED talk is just continuing to happen. The other thing I talk about in my TED talk is the average um, tenure, right? So when I did my TED talk, the Bureau of Labor Statistics across all rows, all levels, um, 4.2 years was the median. Um, and as of January of 2020, it was down to 4.1 years. Now, I don't know what it is right now. It's gonna be interesting when all of this great resignation shakes out and what's gonna happen. Um, the, but let me explain to you what's happened. The tenure for the CEO, and I'll get to CFO, it's coming next. The tenure for the CEO, when I did my TED talk, the average tenure was eight years. It is now, 6.9. That's a pretty big drop in less than three years. The tenure for CFO was 5.1 years. It's now dipped below five. It is now 4.7. And by the way, average age for CEO these days is 59. Average age for CFO is 54. Um, for the CHRO, this, this is not a pretty picture there. Um, it is gone from five to 3.7. For the CIO, because there are some technology people probably, I think that you invited on, um, that good news is for some, it went up. For others, not so good news. So the average for CIO in general went from 4.3 to 4.6. So you get three more months in the, in the role. Um, and the average age is 55. But the CIO um, in the um, healthcare sector went down to 3.9. Why? More disruption, more technology innovation in that category. And you're going to see that happen. That's where that, that um, uh, lower tenure happens because they typically don't have time for the incumbent to get up to speed on the disruption. They have to bring somebody in who's already lived through the disruption and can bring their expertise, right? So just know that that's the phenomenon and it re and it goes back to what I, I think it's the first chapter in my book, it's been a while, but I think it's the first chapter um, and, and that is the rules have changed and you must change too. Here's the most important thing for you to know about the rule that is dominating everything right now, risk aversion. And, and anyone in this group knows a lot about risk and, and minimizing risk, right? So when you have, we had tremendous risk aversion during the Great Recession, and then we were just starting to get heady and things were getting better. And man, companies were saying, maybe I'll venture out a little bit. Maybe I'll be a little bit, take a few more risks. And then boom, here comes the pandemic and they went hunkered down again. So that risk aversion shows up in many, many, many different ways. And it shows up in how they invest their money. It shows up in all kinds of things that they do, but it also shows up in hiring. And that goes back to what I was saying about companies go out to recruiters to find people from their uh, industry. Here's the most important thing that will impact you if you're trying to figure out, Pat, I want to land sooner. How do I shorten my search? My, uh, I was just on the phone with a client this morning, and here's what we're talking about. Plan A's and plan B's, right? So if you want to land sooner, then you need to match the mindset of the risk aversion that's going on out there. And the way companies believe that they mitigate risk, I don't necessarily buy into it because I think they're missing opportunity, but companies are not typically hiring for opportunity. They're hiring to mitigate risk. And again, you know that when you make an evaluation of something, is this going to give me a good return? And is it going to offset the risk that I'm taking, right? So when they're trying to mitigate risk, they really focus on hiring people only from their industry and only from the same scope size company. So if you're looking to go from a very large company to a middle or small size company, you're not gonna persevere as effectively in the interview process, in the search process as somebody from that category, right? They may interview you. And I have uh, a whole bunch of candidates that have now landed, but when they came to me, they said, oh, I'm getting plenty of interviews outside of my industry. I go, great, have you gotten any offers? Nope. Because what happens is you come down to number one and number two. And number one is usually right from the industry, right from the size company. Number two is this opportunity candidate. They're not from our industry, but they're going to bring something fresh and they're going to bring something new. And then when they get to pull the trigger, they go, you know what? I think we, uh, we should stick with our knitting. We, we, don't, we can't afford to take a chance. They could bring us this, but it could be it could be a disaster. We can't afford any disasters in the middle of a pandemic, right? So that's what you're seeing. 
So the shortest distance between where you are and your next role is going to be, this, there's two truths to this phenomenon, is going to be sticking with the industry and the size company. And, and that is also going to mean that you can better leverage recruiters, which means you've got an outside, um, if you add the recruiters the way I want you to, you've got an outside group of folks um, doing work for you on your behalf. So you've got your own proactive and you've got a reactive by connecting to those recruiters and you're a, you're a prime candidate for the same industry, right? Now, does that mean that you can never, ever, ever change industries? No. And if there's anybody on this call who thought about this two or three years ago and said, I want to change industries, then if you did what you need to do in order to be effective on that, you have a, um, a, a more options. And what do I mean that you needed to do? You needed to start networking into that industry. You needed to start connecting with thought leaders, connecting with in, um, executives while you're employed inside of the industry that you want to go to because they're much more receptive when you're employed. There's much easier to get informational interviews. It's much easier to go to your own vendors that you're working with when you're inside of the company and saying, by the way, do you um, you accounting firm, are you working with any companies in this sector? Attorney, are you working in any companies in this sector? Um, salesperson for technology products that I'm buying, the, the um, net, was it NetSuite um, person, the uh, person with the uh, Oracle. Do you, are you working with anyone in this? I'd like some introductions into there. So uh, in other words, it's sort of the, the bulletproof strategy is plan ahead, and you have a much better chance of changing industries because when you have that, that cadre of folks who can vouch for you, then it's not as big a risk. You reduce the risk for them. So now it's candidate number one from the industry. Candidate number two, you're, you are um, a possibility candidate because you're not from the industry, but you're not a stranger because somebody has vouched for you. Somebody has said, you should talk to Bob. You should talk to Mike. You should talk to Mary. They really can bring something to this table that, that will offset any risk that you might perceive, right? So changing industries is not impossible. It's just something you have to think about ahead of time. And I, and I believe, I, I, again, it's um, the I'm, I'm doing a, um, a course related to the book, so I'll get back to, to the specifics, but I'm pretty sure I covered that in the book, but this is the truth, right? Now, here's another thing. The other thing is that in the past, you may have said, all right, I get it. My, my either my emotional runway or my financial runway is running short, and you have one of each. You have an, a financial runway, which may say, I could stay um, uh, and, and between savings and severance, et cetera, I'm good until second quarter of next year, but your emotional runway could have run out three months ago. And it mostly, I can tell you that the emotional runway, the constant beating on doors and interviewing and networking, et cetera, the way that you have to in a full-time job search runs out usually before your financial runway. So if either one of those runways is running out, it, you may have to settle for plan A, which is I'm going back to my industry, my size company it was not my preference, but I can see now what's going on and in in how the rules have changed. However, what I would encourage you to do, and this is why the, the folks I'm working with in outplacement or onboarding to Bulletproof is this, don't settle in. You settled because of your runway short time but don't settle into that role. You continue to maintain um, your networking contacts. You, every 90 days, you're updating your resume. You're starting to leverage your vendors, et cetera, to find connections into the industry or the size company that you wanna go to. And you're doing the things that you didn't know to do before. And once you land, your, um, your, your value in the marketplace goes up exponentially. The day after you land and update your LinkedIn profile, boom, 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 you have a present date, a new company, it starts to change um, the, the amount of activity that you will start to get. It's unfortunate, but it is the way, again, the way that it is. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle, right? Um, so what, um, the other way, let me get to the um, some of the ways. 
searches are taking a little longer these days. So just know that, be patient. Um, they're, they're starting to speed up because definitely companies have gone to go to their first choice and the first choice has said, I've got two other offers, thanks, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. So they're shortening a little bit, but it's still longer because it's mostly done by Zoom. It takes longer for people to feel comfortable um, with the interaction. They wanna get more people involved because they're trying to encourage collaboration um, because they're not in the same space. So just be patient, it is going to take longer and more people are going to be involved, right? Um, so the other most important thing that I wanna share is this is not a journey these days and it will not be forever going forward that you can be passive and and have a haphazard approach to your job search it takes the same kind of strategic planning and business planning as you do when you're inside your role and that means that you have to have a multi-pronged search effort and it has to have an element of proactivity not reactivity so the two biggest um proactivities consist of the recruiter outreach is a proactive and that sort of goes on autopilot once you get those um, working for you. Um, so the next most important is a really solid target list of companies, not the top 500, not somebody from the book of lists, but a really, really well curated list of companies that are the right size, that are really in your sweet spot, so that you know that the company is going to see the perfect fit, right? Um, and within those target companies, you're also going to be making sure that you, I hope you can hear me, The I'm, I am in the front of the street, and it is not only um, uh, it's it's trash day, so sorry about that. Um, but the the um, <laughs> it's it there couldn't be much more noise other than a marching band coming through. Um, the most important thing is that you're taking those target companies, and the first thing you do is go to that target company. I'm going to show you. I got a few minutes, so I'm I'm going to go pop over there in a minute and show you. Go to that target company and connect with the internal recruiters because the internal recruiters are doing a ton of searches at all levels. They are under more pressure to complete their searches sooner, and they know a whole lot more about the company and about the hiring process. They're much more informed, and it's a much um, easier process, better process when you're working with an internal most many times, not all the time. I certainly have had some nightmares, um, but that's, that's a, a really good important thing. So having a target list of companies, connecting with the recruiters inside those companies, and PS, once you land, connecting with and keeping that target list active and connecting with recruiters inside of target companies and recruiters inside of, of target companies, if they're in other industries, you're, that's one of the first places to start. Because if that, that tangential, so I always say they're still going to look at, here's the bullseye, you're from my industry. Here's the next ring out. You're not from my industry, but I can see how, the, how it transfers. And then if, as you get concentrically out from there, um, so if you're going from a Fortune 100 and you want to go to a VC-backed startup, that's really at the outer rings, no matter what the industry, right? So just recognize that. Um, so if they are, they're, if you're in the in the sweet spot, but you want to get one concentric circle out, you start connecting with recruiters in target companies in that next concentric circle. So if you're a gigger, you're you're always thinking, here's where I am, here's the the project that I'm doing, and when you have ten years the that I quoted you, you're really in a project, even if you're getting a W two. Then what's my next project, and where do I want to go next? What's the next hottest industry? I've been in financial services. I want to really target fin tech so I'm going to connect there and I want to go to insure tech because it's still a segment of it right so you connect with those and you start to to identify who do I know inside that company and who do I know who knows somebody inside that company and now you have a strategic um, networking um, when you're networking instead of saying well these are my target companies say I, I'm really looking for a contact inside of X, Y, and Z, TransUnion, inside of Baxter, inside of um, some of the, the rich and famous for, uh, companies of the Chicago area, right? Um, so the, the idea of a, a, you must have a really um, combination reactive and proactive. What's reactive is that partially you connect with recruiters, that's proactive, they reach out to you, that's reactive, they found you. Um, you, you haven't heard me talk a whole lot about postings because one of the things about the rules have changed is many of you have known um, that 
applicant tracking systems or applying online is a big black hole. And I can tell you, I had somebody reach out to me. I can't, I don't know what's going on. Um, I, I'm not getting anywhere. And I said, how many companies have you applied to? She had applied to 200 companies. That's two, at least 200 hours, by the way, because those darn things take forever to complete. She had zero response out of 200. And I said, let's take those 200 hours. Let's connect with recruiters. Let's form a target list of companies and go after them. It may not seem like you're making as much progress initially, but of the, so uh, let me tell you how many comp uh, folks have landed in my uh, Zoom group, um, the Thursday call between there and my clients, 701 people have landed since January, just in that little microcosm, right? It's huge. Now, let me tell you something, out of those 701, only six landed from a job that was posted and that they applied to and didn't have anybody um, you know, to vouch for them or, or um, um, support them. And none of those seven were, is it seven or six? Let me just look, seven. None of those seven were at the more senior levels. They were at individual contributor level, right? Because here's the other thing that's happening. The rules have changed. It's a combination of risk aversion, of trying to make sure that they encourage engagement of their employees and reacting to the pandemic. Companies are erring on the side of hiring internally versus externally. It helps morale, it reduces risk, and especially in the pandemic, they're saying to people, you've been loyal, we're going to move you up. So what's happening? They are moving a B player up internally versus hiring an external A player because it has a mush mushroom effect in some instances. So that means, why do I bring that up when I talk about ATS systems? Because when companies already have quite a selection of internal candidates, they will post the role because they need to check that box and say, we tried to find somebody better than our own group, but th this is who we're gonna promote. Um, and therefore you're applying to roles that are not really the, the, that there really isn't a fair, it's when I talk about the rules kind of being fixed, there's really not a fair competition. They may put you in the mix so they can say they talk to somebody from outside, but your probability of persevering is much more limited, right? So no, preferences avoid risk, preferences to hire from internal, right? So those are some of the major trends in, in what's happening. I'm going to be sending in the uh, Dropbox, I have a multi-page document. I'm not sure how many pages, it's probably 10 or 12 with a little bit more detail in all of this, but let me tell you the highlight or the punchline of all of this. What does all of this mean? It besides meaning that you need to be very proactive in your search and have a, a real business plan about your approach. It also means that you have to work on your mindset because this is not an easy market to be contending in. The hardest thing I think anybody does is do a job search because every day or at least every week or every couple of weeks, somebody is questioning what you've done. They're questioning you. When you're inside your role, you may have a, an annual review, you may have some feedback, but it's not an, a constant, well, what have you done? When did you do that? How, what was the return? Give me some examples of all of that craziness. Uh, and when you start hearing, well, there's 700 people landed, what about me? It has an impact on your mindset every single time. And when your mindset isn't bulletproof, you can't interview well, you can't network well, you can't craft a smart resume. It affects every single thing that you do, right? Which is why I said, talk about emotional runway and financial runway, right? So in addition to the other things that I have, many of you already have this, Michael probably has a thousand copies of it, um, but I did put together a list of resources. Um, when I did my first hundred weeks, so we're going on um, I don't know, week 156 or something, because we're going on three years of doing the Zoom calls. Um, we had a big celebration at 100 weeks, um, and we uh, I, I compiled all of the books and videos and resources that I had um, created since then, and I'm working on part two of that for the second um, celebration. Um, but in there, there are videos, and there are book recommendations and things for both um, uh, mindset in general and some really good resources for getting your mindset up for interviewing because you've got to go into an interview as a equal to the person on the other side 
You've got to go into them approaching it like it's a business meeting. They're going to tell you what they need. You're going to tell them how you can solve the problem. It's like talking to a stakeholder. And you've got to go in with Rocky playing in your mindset. You don't want to go in with, oh my God, they have something I need. It doesn't work that way. You've got to, um, the best thing is the theme from Rocky. Um, for, for those, if there's, when we, hopefully someday I'll do a Fang in Philly and we'll be talking about that more because it's real prevalent there, right? I lived in Philly too. So I used to go to those stairs, but I couldn't run up them. So that mindset piece is so, so, so important. Okay. So there's going to be a lot of follow-up in there because this is a fire hose, but I, and I don't want to take up any more time. I want to give you time for questions um, that may have come in. Um, but I hope that you get a better sense of what's going on out there. Stay active. This is not a summer. It's good to take some vacation. It's good to clear your mind um, for a few days for sure. But this is really a time to stay active because it's not a summer slowdown in hiring. It's really ramping up. And as the companies go, look at all these people who are leaving. What's going on here? Um, it's going to there's going to be a real sense of urgency coming up um, toward the end of summer and early fall for companies because it's happening big time. OK, my, I'm, I'm ready for any yeah. questions that have come in. Great. Uh, OK, Pat. Um... Uh, there's a question from uh, Harlan um, uh, saying, should we try to talk or meet with the recruiter? Mm -mm. So maybe you can handle that? Yeah, great question. Um, in my document, I cover this, but it's useless. If So recruiters only have two jobs to do every day that they get up. Fill mm -hmm. the searches that they have and sell another search because it's all straight commission, right? They mm -hmm. There's one company that has any kind of a um, much of a compensation outside of commission. For everybody else, it's you, you eat what you kill, right? So two jobs to do. So if they don't have a search that you're a fit for, they really can't help you. And if you, if there's a whole psychological, I was a psychology major phenomenon to this, which uh -huh. is why that message that I share on page yep. 14 of that document says, you know, it, it, just keep me in mind if you have a search for me. But the other problem is if I, recruiters really want to help people. I mean, if you're a recruiter, you're trying to make this love match right here, here, here. When people keep calling you and you can't fulfill their wish, it gets, you want to avoid that. You want to avoid saying, sorry, I can't help you. Sorry, I can't help you, right? So connect. it's more important when there's 1.9 million recruiters, it, and I'm going to um, have a caveat to one exception to this. It's more important to just keep adding more recruiters so that you get the one who are doing the next 10 searches, right? Mm -hmm. Then to be trying to get in touch. Now, if you have a recruiter who you had a relationship with, maybe they recruited you for another role in the past, or maybe you hired them to do searches when you were in your role for your company, those you could try to get on the phone and they will be much more receptive. Or mm -hmm. if somebody says, Harlan, you should call this recruiter. I know them well, you can use my name. They will probably take that call because they're trying to preserve that existing relationship. Right. Sure. But anything else, just remember it's a numbers game. Okay, good. Okay. I, that's what I thought you were going to say, but I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. I, oh, Appreciate I don't it. want to be predictable, Harlan. No, no. I just, I was trying to embrace the spirit of the, of the message and your strategy. Okay, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Pat, a uh, question that I thought of uh, as you were making your presentation is, uh, I mean, all of these amazing numbers of, uh, of, of jobs that have uh, been filled over these last several months. Uh, have you analyzed or has somebody analyzed these jobs? Are these jobs that were uh, uh, impacted by the pandemic? And so essentially, uh, there's no sort of net gain, if you will. It's someone lost the job and th they're looking to replace that person, if you will. Uh, um, any any in insight into that? You know, I don't have, I, I, I'm obviously, I'm not doing a longitudinal study of it, but I can tell you anecdotally from what I see. Um, very, few, for example, there's a few people from like retail and hotel. I just had a hotel, a client who's been CFO in hotel. Um, and guess what? Hotel is coming back and they are, they can't find people. Um, so he just landed in a long-term stay, new concept hotel um, platform. Um, but in general, I wouldn't say, and, and that, um, Jerry, would more impact like the overall, what the Bureau of Labor Statistics cares about for y'all. What you care about is the hiring is hiring, right? It seems to be across industries. It has been retail. It has been 
um, uh, hotel or leisure, travel and leisure that was impacted and coming back. Um, certainly consumer products um, that were, you know, have now adapted to e-commerce, et cetera, coming back and booming. Um, so really, and, and industrial, automotive, um, all kinds of industrial. Um, one of my favorite success stories is, is a client who, um, for those of you who are thinking about ageism, she um, will be celebrating her 60th birthday coming up real soon. Um, and she was hired by Google, by Waymo, the self-driving car company. She's definitely the oldest person in the room, including um, the, below the, above the CEO in terms of age. Um, and it didn't matter. What she had was um, she does deals. She's an m &A person and she does a particular kind of deal that is their growth strategy going forward and boom, plucked her um, from Atlanta to the Bay Area, couldn't find what they needed there and plucked her out. Um, uh, Matt, I'm going to deviate from the platform because I can see right in front of me Valerie's question about um, what accounts for the hiring numbers of candidates from the outside and being brought into permanent roles. I'm not saying they're absolutely not, but at the more senior level, it is less often, right? And what you're also seeing is a whole lot of temp to perm or contract to full time. So I've seen a lot of people sort of try to mitigate the risk by saying, I'll bring you in interim. And then they, they're not only trying to mitigate their own sense of risk, but the, but the whole company. So in other words, we get buy-in from across the board. Maybe the CEO and the COO are kind of of different opinion. Um, the COO wants, I'm mean, going not pick on one or the other, but the COO wants a change. They think that bringing in somebody with a fresh point of view would be good. The CEO is not so sure. So they compromise and they bring that person in on a contract. And then if it works, it extends to um, a full-time role. Yeah, because that's what I wanted to bring up that um, I think that happens a lot at the senior roles where levels where these folks on the, the call are. So mm -hmm. I think what you start about the, the gig concept is something that really needs to be utilized by all of us in that interim time period because um, uh, that's just it. Um, yeah. Unless they really know you, people are afraid because of that onboarding process and people they already know. And I've seen that time and time again. So yeah, um, sure. I just thought it'd be best to kind of crystallize that so people understand. Yeah. Very true. That but, is. but I want everybody to believe that even if you're on a W-2, it's sort of a contract. Because in the old days, it was going to be five to seven to 10 years. Do I think that there's never going to be 10-year tenures? Of course not. But the stats are the stats. And my you know, again, I take this small microcosm of my onboard to Bulletproof and see the disruption in that small, relatively small pack of folks. It's just, it's just for sure it's there, right? So yeah. And by the way, just a quick aside that won't, that maybe not a question, but an important one to know. You remember I said these people had a contract and then they they landed full time and they brought somebody in to fill the contract. Do not believe that just because you have a contract, if a full time role comes along, do not let that go. Um, give a give a good um, um, resignation time to the company and try to help them find somebody to backfill. But I can tell you, um, if I if I were to go, probably I'm going to say probably somewhere between 25 and 40. I know that's a big spread, but in general, of people who had contract roles that they thought they were like when the pandemic hit. Oh, I have an 18 month contract role at Chick Fil A. Guess what? cancel the day after the lockdown, just like that. So it comes from their side, the contract goes away. It just, it's as if it never existed. Um, so I don't even think they do as good a job of giving you the, the um, runway that I'm suggesting that you offer to them, which is, hey, I'll stay. I have some clients who said, look, I'll stay for two to three weeks. Um, I'll be available on call to help you assimilate anybody in. But if, if my, my um, conclusion on this is if the company chose, they made a business decision to avoid risk and to not give you a full-time job, you make a business decision to take care of your family, secure your financial future, and take the full-time job if it's it's better than what you have there and, and you know, has the promise, not the guarantee, but the promise of longer tenure and certainly healthcare benefits and all the other things that come with it, right? So, yeah. Okay, uh, Pat, there is another question from Mark Leach about uh, benefits of upgrading to LinkedIn Premium. Yeah, it's, wanna... it is so essential, guys. I, I, I have been teaching LinkedIn since 2005. 
Um, and, and in workshop after workshop after workshop, um, I was saying, you don't need to upgrade. You could get to the next to top level, et cetera. But today, um, what really, um, what really is missing is number one, when you start to do the recruiters, you'll get a few recruiters and they'll say, you've reached a commercial limit. It won't let you get as many recruiters as you want. You have to wait 30 days. It's not worth it. It's worth the money. Um, you know, do the math on your compensation, your weekly income that's being lost, your monthly income that's being lost. Do the math on that and add to it um, a $75 hit to your budget, which I know when there isn't cash flow coming in can be uh, not trivial. But the upside of that, the ROI on that is massive. And I want you to understand people say, well, I'll just do it. And then when I land, no, because there's a whole strategy of using LinkedIn once you land that I've sort of alluded to here um, in terms of making connections, continuing to connect with recruiters, connecting with thought leaders in the companies and the industry that you want to go to next. It's all part of being ready to be ready. I'm, I'm having a, um, an animation of this, but I want to share this picture with you. Um, because I, this is exactly what I want you to understand. Um, I picture this this way. If you've ever been to the circus and some, we probably everybody on this call has, there will be a generation that won't be able to say that, but we have. Um, and there was always the trapeze artist, right? And they would have, they'd be flying back and forth on the trapeze. And after a little bit of, of hanging upside down and all the tricks that they would do, somebody on the other platform would send forward another uh, trapeze, empty trapeze, and they would jump from the one they were on to that one and land safely on the other side. That is bulletproofing. That is what I want you to know that you can have. What is happening today is that you're on that trapeze and you're holding on so tight and you don't let go when the other trapeze comes and then all of a sudden you lose your grip and you're in the net. And when you land in that net, you know that they didn't always just pop right back up, that it's a little tricky in the net. And that's what's going on. So right now I have um, I have a coaching client who keeps saying, I'm, I'm ready to get out of the net, Pat. I'm ready to get out and I don't want to ever land back in the net. I want you to have that visual to know that, that having LinkedIn and keeping that network and continuing to curate and cultivate that network. And um, I will include chapter four of my book in the, um, in the, uh, Dropbox as well, because it really talks about the networking, but that's why you want to use LinkedIn. I mean, let me explain to you that when I do my LinkedIn uh, workshops, they are nine hours. It's eight hours on a Saturday and an hour um, follow up in a webinar for people who have attended. That's how rich and robust it is. Um, but you, you have to be at those now at the business premium level, again, about 70 something dollars a month in order to get the most out of it. Hmm. Um, uh, I have a question actually, Pat, uh, regarding you talk about um, uh, connecting with the recruiters and then connecting with the internal Ooh, I gotta show that. recruiters for, the, for, the, uh, for your target companies. And how do you avoid or how do you handle a conflict when the... Um, External recruiter is, um, you know, uh, uh, is uh, referring you to a job at your target company, which you have an internal recruiter contact. It's kind of not your problem. I mean, I, I have to be for contingent recruiters. That's the job. That's their business. They take that risk. You're far better off having the internal recruiter be the person reaching out. Let me give you an example. I had um, someone here who would reach out to me a couple of years ago and it was so frustrating, but um, Cox Communications here in Atlanta has a very robust internal uh, recruiting group. And they were, um, this person had an internal referral and she sent her resume to the internal referral and the internal referral said, good, I can get this right into the hands of the recruiter. She brings it into the hands of the recruiter. The recruiter gets the resume and looks at the, looks the person's name up in their system and says, oh, tell her to reply back in 90 days. If it will, we'll consider her in 90 days if we haven't filled the role because that candidate was submitted by an external recruiter who by the way, didn't tell her that they had submitted her, had submitted her resume to Cox. And when Cox got it, they said, yeah, we'll put that in abeyance and we'll go do our own search. And if we can find our own candidate, 
we're not gonna talk to that person. So if we haven't found our own candidate in 90 days, we will. So they were using as a security net, other con they were using contingent recruiters, but their preference was candidates that they found and that they sowed. So if you're connected to that internal, so if you're connected as a first level to the internal recruiter and there is an opening and they haven't reached out to you, but an external recruiter who you've connected to submits you, that doesn't disqualify you. That, that recruiter doesn't have to um, pay that can't that um, doesn't have to ignore you because just because they're first level connection the the in order for that internal recruiter to be obligated to pay the external recruiter they have to have had a contract with that company and submitted a uh, candidate based on that so in other words if the internal recruiter hasn't found you and the external recruiter has then you're fine but if the internal recruiter finds you first you're really in much better shape. And that's the world of contingent recruiting. You take that gamble when you when you become go into that. That's the business as usual in that realm, right? So you're far better off connecting with internal recruiters. And before we hang up today, I'll quickly pop over and because um, I have to pop off at eleven for client, but I'll show you um, how to do that. Um, Michael quickly um, submitted a question and says, "Well, if there if there's all these resignations, you know, how are they continue to promote from within?" Bingo, Michael. That's a rude awakening for them. They're not prepared for this. They didn't expect 2.7% of the population to quit work and in, in, in 41% to be resigning. They're not paying attention to that until now. And it's starting to bubble. You know, um, they're, they've been so preoccupied with return to work and how are we going to get people back and what's the rules? And all of a sudden, somebody's sitting there saying, hey, my 401k is as high as it's ever been. I don't need a two hour commute. I don't want to wait till it goes down again. Retirement looks really good to me right now. I'm out of here. That's starting to happen. Um, the people who they say, you're going to come back to the office, they say, no, I got five. I have five choices over here that are remote. I'm going to do that. There's so there's four real categories in there that are happening. Um, but it's, it's going to start to tighten. And that's really what's going to make them be less risk averse. They're not going to have the choice. It's just that simple. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. You're terrific. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I'm sorry, I, I keep uh, going off script for you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I, I, there, there are no other questions in the chat box. Okay. Um, I would love to, um, I, I, Lamar, I saw that you un, unmuted, so maybe you have a question, but I also want to um, pop back on. It'll take two minutes to show you how to find the internal recruiters before I hang up. Okay. I have uh, been the chair of the Cleveland chapter, Patricia for 20 years. Um, I just sent you a LinkedIn invite. This is the best presentation I have heard in many years. Okay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm saying that not uh, because I was, I'm sorry, I took too many notes. I joined you late. Uh, I've got to get a hold of the recording. I'm going to listen to it again. I'm going to share with my co-chair and then we're going to invite you to do a virtual meeting with the Cleveland chapter. And, um, you're awesome. I, I, I hope you never retire. You're making too <laughs> I much. I hope I money. never retire either. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And, and if if you ever get to Cleveland and want to visit the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, give me give me a call. I would love to. Thank you so much for that. I, I used to be in sales for 30 something years. Really? Um, and I, I was in Cleveland many, 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 many times. Cleveland, Toledo, Akron were the, the bowling capital of America. And I was recruited to a job in Ch Chihuga, Chihuga Falls or something like Cuyahoga. that. Cuyahoga. Cuyahoga Falls. And I yeah, didn't want to take it, but I didn't want to upset the CEO who recruited me because I knew him personally. And I, and I, the way I got out of it was I was living in Chicago and I said, do you have a NBA team in Cayuga Falls? And he said, no, we don't. And I said, well, that's my rule. I won't, I won't go to a company <laughs> that doesn't have an NBA team. And, and he, he understood because he knew I was a rabid fan. So um, <laughs> funny, right? Uh, so thank you. I, I, I will let you know about that. And by the way, you mentioned something. If anybody on here is not currently a LinkedIn connection, um, I have a nice big network. So first of all, I make it available to everybody. Um, second of all, feel free to um, just go ahead and connect with me. Just mention Fang so that I can make sure it pops up to the top and, and I can connect it sooner. And I will put, if it's okay, um, Jerry and Matt, if it's okay, I'll put a link in the everyone um, to everyone to for registration for this Thursday Zoom call if anybody's interested. Is that all right? Wonderful. That's fine. 
And uh, Joyce has already uh, indicated that, uh, you know, she'll take care of the Dropbox. And uh, uh, so... Uh, It'll be at, full of goodies. It'll be a, a, a weekend's worth of listening and, and enjoying. Um, let me pop over here quickly and show you how to find the internal recruiters, okay? So I'm going to go back to my homepage. Um, I'm going to put in... Um, We'll put in TransUnion, aren't they? Aren't they somewhere in, in your neck of the woods? Uh, put in TransUnion, they are, they're in Chicago. Um, so there are 8,000 employees there. So there's many ways to get here, but this is the simplest, quickest, most direct. I go to TransUnion, I go to um, the cursor over the number of employees there. And when I get to that, I go to all filters and I scroll down and I start with just the title recruiter. And let's see how many there are. Um, there are seven um, and you'll notice, so, so here's technical recruiter. Usually if there's no picture and it's a recruiter, they're not very active. That person may have uh, retired already. Um, but, um, and it's interesting because Shamil says she's a human resources recruiter. So she's got HR in her title, but she includes recruiters. So she's doing it and also, um, synonymous. So if you ever do this search and you put in recruiter and nobody comes up, try talent acquisition because that's a, another euphemism for recruiter. And if neither one of those work, it means it's a smaller company. And usually if you put in HR and try to find the generalist there, they're usually the person who are who's in charge of that. But I would connect with um, these folks. Now, if, if this is a technical recruiter in India um, and you're in technology, great. But most of the time, what you're going to find is um, you're going to want to connect with the, the internal recruiter. They will often, internal recruiters will align to a business unit. So when you go to look at their profile, it will say marketing and sales, technology, finance, et cetera. If it doesn't say any of those, connect with them. If they don't do search for your category, they just won't connect with you. It's that simple. Um, I would connect with multiple recruiters inside of a company, but do know that recruiters inside of a company are much more cooperative with each other. They share information more so than external, right? So um, it's just go to the company, go to the people, um, go tr try recruiter, talent acquisition, and HR if you can't find any of those, okay? All righty. Well, I write up two minutes to go. I went right to the deadline. <laughs> it, it's, it, once you do a TED Talk, you know how to stay on point for the time. I can tell you that. That was grueling. All right, everybody. It's so great to meet you all. Say hello to Chicago for me. Have some deep dish pizza for me. I don't even eat pizza anymore now that I'm a vegan. I don't think they have vegan deep dish. It would be sacrilegious in Chicago. <laughs> um, I, although I might cheat just for the Chicago pizza. Um, <laughs> And and keep rooting for the the Cubs. Forget the that other team there. Just <laughs> give the Cubs some love, okay? Um, Man, otherwise, I'm happy to come Indians. back anytime that that you need some um, other um, topics to be covered. So thanks again. I will see you all soon. I hope and I hope to see you on my Zoom call. If you just go to bulletproof your career backslash Zoom, you can register for Thursday's call. Okay. Take care. Bye bye everybody. Bye. Thank you.